Services of Communication in Society. The podcast is hosted by the journal Triple C. Access that journal under www.triple-c.at. Welcome to the first episode of this podcast. The basic concept is that I want to talk about uh, communication and society, uh, provide critical uh, analysis. Uh, in between, uh, I will also play uh, a bit uh, of music. Uh, and uh, the topic uh, of this first uh, podcast episode is everyday life and everyday communication in coronavirus capitalism. This episode is based on an article uh, with the same title uh, that was published in the journal Triple C that I co edit. Uh, Triple C stands for Communication, Capitalism and Critique. You can access that paper under www.triple-c.at uh, as an open access uh, uh, article uh, in uh, the journal's volume 18, uh, issue number one. This podcast episode is the first part of a two-part talk. Uh, it will be continued uh, in the next uh, episode uh, of the Communication, Capitalism and Critique uh, pod. Uh, so let me start. Uh, the coronavirus disease uh, is also known uh, as COVID-19. Uh, it's a highly contagious uh, disease. Uh, it has a death rate that is multiple times higher than the one uh, of the seasonal flu. Its common symptoms uh, include, uh, among others, fever, a dry cough, shortness of breath, and extreme tiredness. The first patient suffering from the disease was identified uh, on 1st of December 2019 in Wuhan. Wuhan is a city, uh, a very large city, uh, with more than 11 million uh, inhabitants uh, in uh, China. And uh, given the network and global character uh, of contemporary uh, societies, the novel coronavirus spread globally uh, within a very short uh, time period. When I talk about uh, the coronavirus uh, in this uh, talk, uh, then uh, what I mean is SARS coronavirus 2, uh, but I refer to it uh, for matters uh, of simplicity, uh, just as a coronavirus uh, in this talk, uh, although uh, there are of course uh, also other coronaviruses. On the 11th of March 2020, uh, the World Health Organization declared uh, the coronavirus disease uh, to be a, a, a pandemic, uh, so it was expected that it would have uh, quite severe uh, impacts and would uh, cause uh, many uh, lives. On uh, April 3rd, uh, there were, according to the uh, World Health Organization, 972,640 confirmed coronavirus disease cases uh, in a total of 207 uh, countries, uh, and uh, the virus has resulted uh, in 50,325 uh, deaths uh, worldwide. Many countries introduced wide-ranging public health me measures, such as the shutdown of public life uh, and social, so-called social distancing uh, measures. Uh, this podcast uh, uh, talk uh, asks uh, how have everyday life and everyday communication changed in the coronavirus crisis? Uh, on the one hand, uh, that's one question. The other question is, how does capitalism shape everyday life and everyday communication in this crisis? The first part uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the talk uh, that I'm presenting today focuses on how social space uh, and everyday communication have changed uh, as a, uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. And I will start talking about uh, everyday communication and sociality uh, in the coronavirus uh, crisis. In the coronavirus crisis, uh, politicians had to decide between two basic policy options, uh, namely uh, to either radically disrupt everyday life, uh, which includes asking the majority of citizens to stay at home uh, as the one option, uh, or as the other option to just minimally uh, disrupt uh, everyday uh, life and uh, simply to continue uh, as if nothing uh, had happened. 
The first option tries to save human lives, uh, it tries to reduce the direct communication and direct social relations of humans uh, as far as possible uh, and it, uh, thereby, uh, it, it thereby uh, also takes into account that uh, inevitably uh, an economic crisis uh, will be uh, created. The second option uh, keeps up direct communication and direct social relations uh, of many uh, or the majority uh, of uh, humans, uh, which risks that human lives uh, uh, it risks human lives uh, in order to try to avoid uh, an economic crisis. So very often uh, economic uh, growth uh, and profitability uh, are the underlying uh, motives. In the United Kingdom, uh, Boris Johnson's conservative uh, government first took a laissez-faire approach to the pandemic. Uh, it did not shut down uh, public life. Uh, later, uh, it uh, changed these measures to a certain degree, bringing it more in line uh, with uh, uh, other countries uh, in uh, continental uh, Europe uh, that had uh, implemented the closure of schools, uh, of non-essential businesses, the prohibition of public events, uh, and uh, he had issued the order that people uh, should stay at home. But it was too late. Uh, thousands of people have died thus far uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's a real, uh, a, a deep, uh, profound uh, crisis, not just uh, in the UK, this is a, a global crisis. In a press conference on March the 12th, uh, Johnson said that due to uh, the coronavirus, uh, I quote, uh, many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. At the same time, however, he did not take measures such as shutting down uh, public life. His strategy uh, was first uh, based on uh, letting the virus spread until so-called herd immunity uh, would be re reached. And the government's uh, chief medical uh, officer, Chris Vitti, argued uh, in the same press conference, uh, at the time of this press conference, uh, that the government's top planning assumption is that up to 80% of the population uh, could be infected. Uh, given the UK has 66 million inhabitants uh, and the death rate uh, of uh, the coronavirus disease uh, is on uh, average uh, around uh, 1%. Uh, what this implies is that uh, more than uh, 500,000 people would die in order to reach uh, what in the medical jargon is called herd uh, immunity. Johnson's chief scientific advisor, Patrick Welles, uh, defined this approach uh, by saying, uh, I quote, that of course we do face the prospect of an increasing number of people dying. So Johnson, Johnson and his chief medical and uh, chief scientific advisor chose a social Darwinist approach. Uh, social Darwinism means that uh, the fittest survive uh, in uh, society. Uh, the government, uh, UK government, uh, tolerated uh, that others die, although public health measures could have reduced the amount uh, and share uh, of death. What is social Darwinism all about? In 1909, Charles Darwin's half-cousin, uh, Francis Galton, uh, argued uh, that society should be based on, I quote, the workings of nature by securing that humanity shall be represented by the fittest. And uh, so it's the application, uh, social Darwinism is the application uh, of Darwin's principle of the uh, survival of the fittest from nature to society. And Johnson and his advisors plan to use this principle uh, of the survivors uh, of the fittest as population policy uh, governing uh, society uh, at the time uh, of a very profound uh, crisis uh, of uh, society. In radically neoliberal societies such as the United Kingdom uh, and uh, the United States, uh, the Darwinist concept uh, of nature uh, has as a consequence uh, been applied to society. In 1889, uh, the Darwinist uh, Alfred Russell Wallace uh, wrote uh, or defined survival uh, of the fittest as, I quote, uh, the best organized uh, or the most healthy uh, or the most active or the best protected or the most intelligent uh, will inevitably in the long run gain an advantage over those which are inferior in uh, these qualities. That is, the fittest will survive. End of the quote. So the Johnson government sees society uh, as a realm of the survival uh, of uh, the fittest.
I next want to talk a bit about the phenomenon uh, of social distancing. So in the coronavirus crisis, uh, social distancing has become a public health policy, a public health uh, measure, uh, and it uh, is also a very frequently uh, used keyword uh, in uh, public uh, discourse. When we look at humans and in societies, then it's clear that humans are social and societal beings. They live in and through social relations in society. Uh, and communication also plays a role in this context, because communication, as I define it, uh, is the process of the production and reproduction uh, of sociality, of social relations, of social structures, uh, of social systems, uh, and of society uh, as a whole, uh, as a totality. In a social relation, at least two human beings, could also be more than uh, two, uh, make sense of each other's actions, they interpret uh, each other's actions, they relate to each other uh, mutually. Each of them interprets what the other uh, is doing and as a consequence they at least uh, change uh, their thought patterns, they recognize uh, uh, each, uh, 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 each other's uh, but they also might change their experiences of the world. Uh, this might result uh, in new uh, actions. Uh, it could also result uh, in uh, collaboration in the production of new uh, social uh, reality. Uh, the measure of social distancing that is now practiced as a response to the coronavirus crisis does not mean that the solution uh, of social relations and of uh, the social, uh, it rather means the radical reorganization uh, of social uh, relations. In social distancing, humans avoid face-to-face -face, uh, social relations. They substitute face-to-face uh, -face or what I would call direct social relations by mediated social relations, where communication is organized with the help of the telephone, social media, messenger and video communication software such as WhatsApp, Telegram, Zoom, Skype, Panopto, Blackboard, Collaborate, Jitsi, Discord, uh, etc. So when we speak of mediated social relations, then uh, communication technologies or so-called means of communication play a, a role uh, as the mediating uh, means uh, that uh, are used uh, for organizing uh, social uh, relations uh, over uh, physical uh, distances. So, social distancing isn't an avoidance of communication, uh, it is the substitution of face-to-face -face communication by mediated communication. Mediation uh, in the coronavirus crisis has become a strategy of both avoiding, avoiding direct uh, social relations, uh, and also survival, uh, so that more humans uh, survive. Uh, social distancing is not a distancing from the social uh, and from other humans, uh, it is communication and sociality at a distance. So over uh, spatial and temporal distances, uh, communication and social relations uh, continue uh, to be organized uh, in other uh, manners. It's not the end, it's not the, uh, the uh, dissolution uh, of social uh, relations. So without social relations, human beings wouldn't be able uh, to survive. So the distancing uh, is more the time-space distanciation uh, of the social end of uh, communication. It's not the distanciation from uh, communication. It's the distanciation of uh, social relations and communication uh, over spatial, uh, over, uh, over in space uh, and in time. In 2020, billions of humans have experienced and practiced a radical rupture and uh, a radical reorganization of their social life. Uh, in Generally, in modern society, societies, we organize our everyday life with social practices um, that take place in distinct uh, social systems. In such distinct social systems, we repeatedly, in a quite routinized manner, spend certain time periods together with others in order to achieve uh, certain uh, goals. So this results in a kind of uh, spatial differentiation between between uh, different social systems where we spend uh, certain time periods uh, regularly. Uh, think, for example, uh, of the home, uh, the workplace, uh, public spaces such as ca cafes, uh, restaurants, uh, public transport, uh, and uh, offices, uh, and so on.
in um, there is a division of labor in uh, in the division of activities uh, in capitalist uh, societies which means that humans spend certain times of the day in particular spaces so an example uh, is the work in an office or in a factory from monday to friday between 9 a.m uh, and 5 p.m uh, this means that space and times we could say are zoned into particular time periods that we sp typically spend uh, at certain uh, places However, space and time have also been changing uh, in uh, the everyday life uh, of capitalism uh, due to certain tendencies such as uh, flexibilization uh, of the world, uh, globalization, digitalization, individualization uh, and neoliberalization. Uh, all of these tendencies uh, have transformed uh, the space-time uh, of capitalist and society uh, and everyday life uh, in uh, society. Uh, there's a consequence more and more not all people, but more and more people uh, have uh, started to work from different spaces, not just uh, a classical uh, workplace, uh, a classical office or a classical uh, factory. Uh, they have started working uh, from different spaces and places, including their, uh, their homes, public spaces, uh, and they did so at a variety of time, not necessarily uh, from 9 to 5, but at uh, different uh, times. So, as a consequence, the workplace, the home uh, and public spaces have probably converged. The boundaries between leisure time and labor time uh, have become blurred. Yeah? The boundaries between play and labor have become blurred. The boundaries between consumption and production have become blurred. The boundaries between the office and the home have become uh, blurred. For many people, this tendency has meant an increase of the labor time uh, and the extension of the logic of capital uh, into spheres outside of the traditional workplace. So this blurring of boundaries, if it's uh, determined by the interest uh, of uh, workers and everyday uh, people, then it can also actually be a good thing. Uh, but for many people it actually has m meant uh, that they have worked more uh, for uh, corporations, uh, that there was more exploitation uh, of uh, labor time or what uh, Marx called uh, an absolute uh, form of surplus value production, which means that uh, humans uh, work uh, more time uh, overall. Or, or, or overall. Uh, at the same time, uh, many people work under precarious uh, conditions so that they work longer hours than uh, they used to be uh, traditionally, uh, did not result uh, in higher va higher uh, uh, wages or, or relative uh, wages taking uh, inflation uh, into uh, uh, a, a, a account, but stagnating or even declining uh, wages, whereas large corporations uh, profits uh, and the profit share uh, in uh, economies has increased. So the profit share uh, is the sh total share uh, of uh, profits in the gross domestic uh, product. And in many parts of the world uh, in the past uh, decades, neoliberalism has resulted in wage repression, which means the wage share, the total sh uh, sum of wages and its share in the GDP has been decreasing, whereas the profit share, uh, the share uh, of uh, profits uh, of uh, private uh, companies uh, in the GDP uh, has uh, increased. Yeah? So more and more people uh, have had to work more and longer uh, hours uh, and harder and in a more intense manner in order to survive, but they have done so in very uh, precarious uh, ways. I will next talk uh, about uh, the radical transformation that the space-time of everyday life uh, has been undergoing in the coronavirus crisis. The coronavirus crisis brought about a quite radical transformation uh, of the organization of the space-time of everyday life. Uh, workplaces and public spaces were shut down. The physical and social differentiation uh, of the spaces of everyday life uh, collapsed. Workplaces and schools suddenly completely converged with the home. Uh, the blurring and the convergence of social spaces that I talked about yeah, as being typical for neoliberal capitalism now was taken to it, it, its extreme uh, intermediary spaces uh, of public life where we used to spend leisure time and uh, transit times uh, in uh, locales such as cafes, restaurants, parks, uh, natural spaces, uh, public transport uh, and so on, such spaces emptied out, uh, which created ghost towns and urban uh, ghost uh, spaces. 
the a locale uh, is a particular physical or virtual space that is used at a particular time for social acts and action uh, and communication uh, that are focused on a particular uh, goal. Yeah? So locales uh, are the places and physical settings uh, of humans' uh, communicative uh, practices. So there are uh, spatial, temporal, spatial and temporal dimensions uh, of our uh, everyday uh, practices uh, and when it concerns uh, the spaces uh, then uh, the everyday spaces of our uh, practices uh, are called uh, locale or locales. In the coronavirus crisis mm, the social spaces and locales uh, of uh, work, leisure, education, the public sphere, the private sphere, friendships, family and so on uh, converge in the locale of the home. Uh, so uh, the, coron the coronavirus crisis, the home has become a kind of super locale, uh, a kind of a super place uh, of everyday uh, life. At the time of when we look, that's the spatial uh, change. Yeah, we have the home uh, is this uh, super place uh, of everyday life uh, emerging. Yeah? But then there are also temporal changes uh, in the coronavirus crisis. So at the time of the coronavirus crisis, daytime uh, has to be simultaneously working time, play time, educational time, family time, shopping time, uh, time for housework, leisure time, care time, psychological coping time, because. Uh, people are afraid of losing their lives, uh, that their friends, families, communities, uh, that people are, uh, might die due to the uh, coronavirus disease uh, and so on. So they have to psychologically uh, cope with this, uh, with this uh, ex ex exceptional situation, with this situation uh, of uh, emergency yeah, that has become uh, the new normality. Um, so activities that humans usually uh, perform in different social roles at different uh, times in different uh, places uh, have now converged in activities uh, that they conduct in one place, uh, in one locale, uh, the home. Yeah, the home is this supra locale uh, of everyday uh, life. And there is then a certain danger uh, that uh, the human beings in their everyday life uh, in the coronavirus crisis uh, experience an overburdening. So there's the danger of the overburdening uh, of uh, the individual that I now want to talk about a bit. So these types of convergences uh, in the coronavirus crisis that I talked about can easily result uh, in an overburdening uh, of the individual. It is difficult for individuals to manage multiple social roles at the same time uh, in one place, the place of the home. Uh, this situation is made worse by the exceptional psychological burdens that the coronavirus crisis causes. Individuals have to worry, or many of them worry, about uh, the lives of their families, uh, lives of their friends, their own lives. They have to think of how to organize everyday activities, yeah? uh, such as shopping, going out without risking their lives uh, and others' lives. Uh, they have to psychologically cope with not being physically close to their family members, to their parents, friends, community members, uh, and so on. Uh, they dedicate time uh, to uh, supporting old, weak, and ill people from their families uh, and communities uh, who self-isolate uh, and are uh, a part of, of and form high-risk uh, groups. Uh, in such a crisis, lots of our time is survival time. What do I mean by survival time? So survival time is time uh, that is used in such a crisis for uh, activities that secure our immediate physical, psychological, uh, and, and social survival. Uh, routine activities yeah, uh, that are quite mundane, everyday activities uh, that we uh, conduct in everyday life in a very routinized uh, manner are now no longer self-evident. Yeah? Uh, they can come become challenging tasks to which a significant amount uh, of time uh, and also psychological uh, energy uh, need to uh, be dedicated. So in the coronavirus crisis, survival work and time dedicated to survival work shapes our everyday life. And Given that direct communication is limited yeah, uh, because of social distancing measures, more time now needs to also to be spent on organizing communication uh, at a distance. Yeah. Uh, there are times, uh, also times where individuals feel they are not able to properly continue yeah, and uh, to function, uh, so to speak. Yeah. They have to cope with fears of death 
illness uh, and fears uh, of the future. So in times of such crisis, humans know, in times of crisis, humans normally like to come together with their closest companions in order to help each other and support one another. But in the coronavirus crisis, physical proximity of larger groups is discouraged yeah, because it's a uh, it's a risk, yeah? so social distancing, but as a consequence, social distancing puts psychological burdens on many human beings. Yeah? They cannot be physically close to some or many uh, of their loved ones. Yeah? And mediated communication via the internet, mobile phones, apps and so on, uh, can of course provide uh, a certain emotional support, yeah? but at the same time it lacks the capacity uh, of uh, direct face-to-face uh, -face communication, it lacks the capacity uh, of being able to touch, feel, smell, hug uh, and so on uh, one another. Yeah? Uh, you can say nice words to a friend or a relative uh, via a webcam, uh, but you cannot look the person properly probably uh, into the eyes, yeah? uh, you cannot hack that person via uh, the internet or via the mobile phone. Uh, so physical proximity is an important aspect of care that is missing uh, in mediated communication. It is much more difficult to communicate emotions, love, solidarity and empathy uh, in mediated communication than in face-to-face -face, uh, communications. House workers who have traditionally uh, been predominantly women uh, have traditionally had to deal with multiple types of work. Yeah? Uh, so we could say that the coronavirus crisis is a process of radical housewifeization that confines work, social action, and communication uh, to the super local uh, of the home. And this condition has been characteristic for house workers uh, since a long uh, time. It is Decisive in this situation of the coronavirus crisis, of this profound emergency situation uh, of how the state, how governments uh, act. And I think there's a continuum of how governments can act that can range from uh, on the one uh, end uh, neoliberal action to what could be called socialist uh, action uh, on uh, the other end. So what do I mean by this? So neoliberal government and state action tolerates unemployment and precarity of workers. Uh, it is only concerned with bailing out companies but not uh, supporting every day uh, people, uh, the working class. Uh, neoliberal state action does not secure the social security, the livelihood, uh, the income, uh, rent payments and the survival uh, of the working class. Yeah? Socialist state action yeah, uh, is in such a crisis situation uh, is a different uh, form of reaction. Uh, it cares first and foremost about the human being. Yeah? Uh, so it's a, a humanist type uh, of action uh, whose uh, first and foremost aim is to secure uh, the survival uh, of human beings, yeah? to secure the survival of the working class by measures such as uh, an unconditional basic income during the crisis time, the continuation of wage payments for workers and freelancers, rent freezing uh, and lots of other measures yeah, that uh, support survival uh, and uh, well-being. Uh, so the uh, immediate goal is that uh, people can continue uh, to live, do not starve, uh, can continue uh, to live in their uh, in, in their homes, continue to have uh, an income, uh, social security uh, and so on. So socialist crisis action makes sure that humans have the time and resources needed to survive the crisis without becoming poor, poor, indebted, bankrupt and so on. Socialist crisis action it recognizes the need of humans for sufficient time during which they engage in survival work. Socialist crisis action it provides the material foundations needed for survival work. Neoliberal crisis action is opposed to the antagonist of socialist crisis action. It's a type of state action and of government action that tolerates an increase of poverty, of misery, an increase of debt, an increase of precarity, an increase of homelessness, an increase of unemployment and so on. Uh, neoliberal crisis action reorganizes society in the situation of profound crisis uh, in the interest uh, of capital, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, of uh, capital, so it's uh, a, a state of exception that is uh, that is seized uh, in order to uh, enforce the interests uh, of uh, of capital. Yeah? Uh, Naomi Klein wrote this book about disaster capitalism, where she points out uh, that disasters, profound crises, are often uh, a a state of shock, yeah? 
uh, it's a uh, book is called the shock doctrine yeah uh, so uh, in this situation of shock such as the coronavirus crisis society human beings are vulnerable yeah? uh, and uh, those uh, powerful groups uh, can seize this opportunity uh, in order to uh, enforce quite particularist uh, interests yeah? uh, I'm not saying that this is necessarily uh, happening uh, everywhere uh, but this is a danger that is happening uh, that it's happening uh, in this uh, uh, situation uh, the counter force to it uh, is uh, is, is socialist struggle uh, and uh, socialist uh, action and thinking neoliberal and capitalist crisis action uh, and its logic to its end uh, implies that such a type of neoliberal and capitalist crisis management uh, establishes a state organized dictatorship uh, of capital yeah? so the dictatorship uh, of capital that results in war uh, in uh, fascism uh, in extermination uh, of uh, weak people uh, of uh, political uh, opponents uh, that's the big danger in such a uh, quite a profound crisis situation in any case the coronavirus crisis is a rupture it is an existential crisis of society and of humanity uh, this crisis poses both potentials for the development of socialism and solidarity on the one side uh, and uh, of slavery uh, and uh, fascist dictatorship uh, on uh, the other side I think uh, it's now maybe time uh, for a break, uh, a musical uh, break. Uh, I looked for some uh, music that is available uh, as Creative Commons uh, licenses uh, online uh, and I will uh, play a song uh, by one of my favorite bands, the band Low. Uh, the song is called Walk into the Sea. Uh, it was performed at the Old Tomorrow Parties Festival uh, in 2008 uh, and uh, there is a uh, uh, recording of it uh, that one can listen to and download uh, and uh, that can be used based on a Creative Commons license uh, available uh, in the Free Music Archive yeah, that's uh, available under freemusicarchive.org uh, and uh, thanks to the Free Music Archive uh, thanks to uh, yeah, the, to Low uh, as artists to agreeing to make this uh, piece of music uh, available uh, as a Creative uh, comments uh, online. Uh, we will now uh, listen to it uh, and then uh, the talk will continue uh, after low and walk into the sea. <laughs> I could walk into the sea And I could choke away the memory Do I have to stay alive Just to keep our dresses wide You come to me in dreams With all the other pretty things And you tell me about Savior and how the soul lives on forever. And time 
als Creative Commons uh, und freemusicarchive.org. Uh, uh, so, uh, I will continue uh, with uh, this talk uh, on the coronavirus uh, crisis. And next section focuses on social space, everyday life and everyday communication in the coronavirus crisis. Uh, based on the French Marxist humanist philosopher Henri Lefebvre's theory uh, of space that he worked out uh, in his book The Production of Space, the critical theorist, uh, Marxist humanist uh, and uh, geographer uh, David Harvey uh, has written the essay Space is Keyword. In this uh, essay, uh, Harvey provides a typology of social, social space and in Lefebvre's work there is a distinction between perceived, conceived and lived spaces. So these are Lefebvre's three dimensions uh, of social space. Harvey builds on that distinction and distinguishes between physical space, representations of space and spaces uh, of representation. He adds to Lefebvre's theory the distinction between absolute space, relative space and relational space. What does this mean? So, uh, absolute space. Spaces are absolute uh, because they are locales, uh, certain places that have certain physical boundaries. Uh, relative space. Uh, such spaces are relative because there are objects placed in them that have certain uh, spatial distances uh, from each other. And then there's relational space, which means that these objects also stand uh, in relations to uh, each other. And the question is, what does this mean in society? What does it mean in a social uh, system? So think, for example, uh, of a talk given by someone in a lecture hall. The lecture hall here is the physical space. Humans take a seat uh, in that hall. Uh, that are placed in a relative distance from each other, uh, which constitutes relative space. And then they listen to the talk, uh, they discuss, uh, they voice an opinion, uh, there's debate going on, uh, and so on. This is uh, the relational social space. And now in the coronavirus crisis, this situation changes, yeah? space changes. There are now lots of social relations organized at a distance, yeah? like this podcast or online lectures. Uh, which means there are multiple physical spaces connected uh, to each other. Uh, communication takes place uh, via uh, global uh, communication technologies uh, such as the internet, mobile phones, uh, apps, social media uh, and so on. In respect to relative space, humans listen from different places uh, at different times using communication uh, technologies. So space-time is organized uh, via the help of communication te technologies uh, in a flexible uh, manner. And in relational space there is no or hardly any uh, direct face-to-face -face, uh, social communication. Uh, social relations and communication are organized uh, over uh, distances. Now, this means that in the coronavirus crisis, humans are largely confined to the physical space on the home of the home. They uh, experience, conceptualize, live, and thereby also produce social space time in manners that make social spaces converge. So the home uh, constitutes uh, a kind of supra time space place, uh, a supra local. Uh, communica and communication technologies play a decisive role here in organizing everyday life from the place of the home uh, in the coronavirus crisis. In the book uh, Critique of Everyday Life, uh, especially in the second volume, uh, Henri Lefebvre uh, conceptualizes everyday uh, life. He refers to it uh, as all of the social practices uh, that take place uh, in, within the totality uh, of society. Uh, so Lefebvre writes that everyday life is, I quote, an intermediate and a mediating level of society. And he identifies three dimensions uh, of everyday life. Uh, what he calls the natural forms of necessity, that's nature, but as part of society. Uh, then the economic realm as the appropriation uh, and uh, production of objects and goods. And the realm of culture, which means that Lefebvre sees nature, the economy and culture uh, as, the, as three important realms, or, uh, realms of everyday life and of society. What in my opinion is missing here is the realm of politics, yeah, where humans uh, take collective actions that are binding for all uh, and that take on uh, the form uh, of certain uh, rules. 
so the critique of uh, everyday life analyzes how young women live, uh, or I quote, uh, Lefebvre writes, uh, it analyzes how badly they live or how they do not live at all. Lefebvre argues that in phases of fundamental so societal change, uh, I quote, everyday life is suspended, shattered, or changed. And in the coronavirus crisis, uh, we see such a suspension, shattering, uh, and changing uh, of soci society. Uh, what has happened uh, is that the uh, reorganization of uh, everyday practices, structures, and routines uh, has been uh, necessitated. Lefebvre distinguishes two uh, levels of everyday life, uh, the lived and the living. So the lived uh, is in French le vécu, uh, and the living is le vivre. Uh, and uh, what does he mean by that? So first, uh, the lived, le vécu, this refers to the individual uh, and its experiences, knowledge, uh, practices. Uh, it's about doing and it's about the present. Whereas the living, le vivre, re more refers to the group, uh, to the context uh, of action to and to its horizon, to structures uh, and present. So how I understand uh, this distinction is that the lived is more about practices and the living is more about the structural conditions. So what he describes Le Favre is, is everyday life as a dialectic uh, of structures uh, and agency that mutually produce each other in a uh, in a dialectic. Uh, so we could say that at the level of the lived, humans produce uh, it, through social practices uh, and communication uh, social uh, objects. Yeah? Uh, so uh, it's social production that takes place through communicative uh, practices. They do so, however, under conditions of the living, the structural conditions that enable and constrain human practices, uh, production and communication. So the level of the living consists of an interaction of social structures, social systems and social institutions. You can say that all structures, systems and institutions have economic, political uh, and cultural uh, dimensions. In many social systems, uh, one of these dimensions is dominant so that we can differentiate between economic, political uh, and cultural uh, aspects of society, uh, structures, systems uh, and institutions. At the level of the lived, humans relate to each other through communicative practices and we can say that these communicative practices are the foundations of the production, reproduction and differentiation of uh, structures, of systems uh, and uh, institutions uh, that condition uh, human practices. Yeah? So there is a kind of uh, reflexive dialectical relationship between practices uh, and uh, structures. Yeah? We can also say it's a dialectic of the living uh, and uh, the lived. Yeah? Uh, or it, it's a dialectic of human subjects uh, and the social uh, objects. Means of communication also play an important role here. They mediate the dialectic of objects uh, and subjects uh, and the relations between uh, humans. And I developed a typology uh, of five types uh, of the means uh, of uh, communication that's also uh, outlined uh, in my uh, book, uh, Capitalism uh, and Communication, uh, a Critical uh, Theory. So what are these five types uh, about? There are primary communication technologies, that's face-to-face -face interaction using the human body and the mind. There's no media technology, no mediation. Uh, examples are the communication uh, forms such as the theatre, the concert, performance and interpersonal communication. Secondary communication technologies make use of media technology for the production of information. Examples are classical mass media, newspaper, magazines, books, uh, technologically produced arts and culture and so on. Tertiary communication technologies, these are the third level communication technologies, they make use of media technologies for the production and consumption of information, however not for the distribution of information. These are for example storage technologies such as CDs, DVDs, tapes, records, vinyl records, yeah, Blu-ray discs, hard disks, uh, USB uh, uh, sticks and so on. Fourth level uh, communication technologies, quaternary uh, communication technologies, make use of media technology for the production, distribution and consumption of information. Examples are TV, radio, film, the telephone uh, and the internet.
And then there are level five communication technologies, quinary communication technologies. These are digital media technologies that enable the so-called prosumption uh, of information and user-generated content. Prosumption is a combination of uh, production and consumption in one word, uh, which means the cons uh, that there are uh, means of communication that enable consumers of information to become producers of communication. And examples are uh, internet, social media, user-generated content platforms, and so on. And now, in everyday life, uh, in the coronavirus crisis, uh, has changed. Everyday communication has ch uh, has changed. There, yeah? humans more isolate themselves as a strategy of uh, survival. They avoid direct communicative relations, uh, which means that uh, dense networks of direct communication and direct social relations are suspended uh, at the structural level of the lived. Uh, the economic, political and cultural dimensions are no longer organized as separate places and spaces. Uh, they tend to converge in the social system of the home, which means that the home takes on the place of a supra place from where economic, political and cultural life are organized and structured from a distance. Well, women spend the vast majority of their life, uh, of their time, uh, now in physical isolation uh, in and from their homes. From their homes, uh, they access uh, and organize social structures, social systems and institutions uh, at a distance yeah, by making use of uh, second level, third level, fourth level and fifth level means uh, of communication. What is decisive here is that the use of the primary means of communication, face-to-face uh, -face communication, uh, tends to be uh, avoided in the coronavirus crisis. Under regular conditions, uh, humans organize society in the form of separate social systems that they access in everyday life by commuting to different, the different specialized physical uh, places. In the coronavirus crisis, uh, specialized physical places are suspended. Uh, humans who are located in the physical place, uh, place and places of their homes uh, organize these systems at a distance with the help of uh, primarily mediated forms of communication, uh, so that second third, uh, fourth and fifth level uh, means of communication. Humans hardly communicate each other in this crisis face to face, but through mediating uh, and media uh, mediating communication technologies, communication technologies uh, that uh, have a mediating uh, effect. Next, I want to deal with questions of deceleration, of slowing down everyday life in the coronavirus crisis. I want to pose the question, uh, does the coronavirus crisis bring about the deceleration uh, of everyday uh, life? So we, in the coronavirus crisis, most humans traverse only smaller physical distances and also fewer goods are transported over, over smaller distances. Uh, there are fewer people for overall less time uh, on the streets uh, and in public uh, places. At the same time, the number of social activities and communicative practices taking place from the home uh, and uh, being conducted from the home uh, at a distance has massively increased. Uh, the consequence is that communication networks such as the internet and mobile phone networks are used uh, at a maximum or almost maximum uh, capacity. There is a thinning out of social activities in public spaces that, however, corresponds to the thickening and multiplication of social activities taking place in the home uh, and locally. We could say we can say that the coronavirus crisis deglobalizes and therefore localizes everyday life. Uh, the German uh, critical theorist and sociologist Hartmut Rosa has written uh, books and uh, about uh, deceleration uh, and. Ex and acceleration, yeah, so he's a, uh, he developed a theory uh, of acceleration, uh, and he argues uh, that the coronavirus crisis means, uh, I quote, forced deceleration, a slowing down of everyday life. He argues that there is a, I quote, massive deceleration of real physical life, where on the one hand uh, one feels silenced and excluded, but on the other hand one discovers new forms uh, of solidarity. Rosa is overall rather optimistic about the consequences of the coronavirus crisis. On the one hand, he sees the loss of ontological security and trust so that, I uh, quote, relationships become suspect, uh, and there is, uh, I quote again, growing alienation. On the other hand, he sees new opportunities for what he calls resonance. Resonance is a condition where humans enter into unalienated relations with others uh, and the world. 
Rosa says, uh, this is a quote, we have time. Suddenly we can hear and experience what is happening around us. Maybe we indeed hear the birds look at the flowers and greet neighbors. Hearing and answering instead of domination and control are the beginning of a relation of resonance from which something novel can emerge. How, um, how can you make sense of what Rosa is saying? Uh, yeah, how uh, should it be assessed? Uh, I think the coronavirus crisis certainly means that humans make fewer direct social relations. They commute less, they live more locally, they traverse less physical distance. Uh, but this does not necessarily imply uh, the slowdown, the deceleration of social life. So the speed uh, of social life uh, primarily I mean, I mean, is, is about the amount of experience uh, experiences we make per unit of time, yeah, per minute, hour, uh, day, week, month, uh, and year, and so on. Even if we don't move at all, uh, it, it could, can still be a high-speed society where vast amounts of information are rapidly uh, processed yeah? uh, and where large numbers of decisions are taken and many actions are performed uh, per unit uh, of time. So the coronavirus crisis does not necessarily slow down the pace of modern uh, life, uh, if they, uh, whether the pace of modern life and if it's uh, accelerated or slowed down uh, depends first and more foremost uh, on questions of political economy. Uh, so th this pace depends on whether or not governments take measures that allow humans to survive without depending on constantly having to perform labor under precarious conditions. Yeah? So uh, economic production, uh, wage work uh, and so on uh, are decisive in capitalist uh, society. And the question is uh, if they are suspended and human beings still have an income because they get, for example, uh, a, uh, a, a basic income yeah, and uh, and uh, can continue to survive or if they must uh, struggle from the place of the home uh, and work the same amount uh, of uh, hours uh, which can uh, result in uh, overwork, uh, there are additional psychological or social burdens uh, and so on. So all of the, this question of uh, does this crisis accelerate or decelerate uh, or have no impact on the pace of life depends on the question uh, on whether or not governments provide the material foundations that help to avoid uh, an overburdening of the individual uh, resulting from the convergence of social spaces, social times uh, and social roles. What human beings definitely realize in the coronavirus crisis is that life, well-being, health and survival are not self-evident. Uh, so this crisis is a radical confrontation of the individual and society by death and also by the fear uh, of death, uh, illness, uh, so very existential fears, yeah, very existential questions. Uh, this collective experience of the fear of death can create new forms of solidarity in society uh, and also elements uh, of socialism. The philosopher Slavoj Zizek uh, argues in this context, I quote, the threat of viral infection also gave us a tremendous boost to new forms of local and global solidarity. Plus it made clear the need for control over power itself. The present crisis demonstrates clearly how global solidarity and cooperation is in the interest of the survival of all and each of us. End of quote. However, I do think that when, if right-wing demagogues manipulate these fears, then the realization of such socialist potentials might be destroyed. Under such conditions, fascist potentials that advance dictatorship, genocide, war, inhumanity and mass murder uh, might emerge or might be realized. Yeah? So the coronavirus crisis radicalizes the perspectives for the future of society. It makes it more likely that we are either heading towards socialism or towards barbarism. Next, I want to talk about coronavirus, risk society, and class society. So the coronavirus disease and other risks can also hit the rich and powerful, such as Prince Charles, Prince Albert, Boris Johnson, Rand Paul, Michel Barnier, or Tom Hanks. But this circumstance does not imply, uh, as the German uh, sociologist Ulrich Beck uh, argued in his uh, book on the risk society, uh, that we now live in a classless world risk society. Uh, in my opinion, mm, this crisis does not imply uh, that existential risks affect everyone equally beyond, uh, as uh, Beck says, status uh, and class. 
So the rich and powerful, they can purchase access to the best private doctors and hospitals. Yeah? The rich and powerful can escape from risk, uh, risks, whereas the poor workers in everyday life uh, primarily suffer the consequences uh, of privatization and universal commodification brought about by neoliberal uh, capitalism. Uh, simply put, this means that they are more likely to die. Yeah? Uh, the coronavirus crisis shows that the risk of society is first and foremost a class society. And I want to look at different groups in society and how they are affected by uh, the coronavirus crisis. Uh, let's first have a look at the most vulnerable groups in society. In the coronavirus crisis, those worst hit uh, and most vulnerable are humans who do not have a home to which they can retreat. Think, for example, of the homeless, uh, of refugees, of those who are on the run uh, or live uh, in uh, a refugee camp. It's very difficult for these groups to shield themselves from the virus. Uh, politicians can make different choices here. They can either protect these vulnerable groups by creating and providing suitable shelters that allow social distancing, or they can abandon these groups, which implies that many vulnerable uh, individuals uh, will be affected and will die in the end. Uh, also, humans in developing countries uh, are especially uh, affected and are quite vulnerable in this respect because they often live in overcrowded spaces, in poor metropolises, or they live in areas that lack a a access to water, soap, hospitals, doctors, uh, and so on. So, protective measures such as social distancing and washing one's hands uh, might be uh, way more difficult to organize in a developing country uh, than in a developed country. Uh, so, the and this also means that the lack of material foundation of protection can especially and affect harm uh, affect and harm humans in poor countries uh, in poor regions. What about the working class in the coronavirus crisis? There is a group of workers who cannot work from their homes and from a distance. Yeah? They depend uh, on the differentiation of social spaces and direct social relations in order to produce. Think, for example, of the personal services conducted by cooks, cleaners, waiters, bartenders, hairdressers, travel attendants, childcare workers, uh, and so on. Uh, also think of manufacturing labor, construction labor, agricultural work, food process processing, garment labor, drivers, transport labor, refuse labor, uh, elementary labor, uh, and so on. Many of these occupations uh, have low in, or just medium skills uh, and, are, uh, and rather low wages. Given that many workplaces were shut down in the coronavirus crisis, uh, lower paid and low, uh, lower skill, blue collar workers faced a high likelihood of becoming unemployed. For example, in Austria, uh, the number of unemployed uh, rose from around 400,000 to 550,000 uh, within 10 days uh, in March to 2020, just because of the coronavirus crisis. And looking at uh, unemployment data uh, makes evident uh, that the newly unemployed uh, to a large degree uh, belong to sectors such as accommodation, uh, gast gastronomy, uh, and construction. And uh, then there are white collar workers. So in the coronavirus crisis, especially highly qualified white collar workers can continue to work from their homes. So normally they work uh, in an office uh, or, or used to work from home already as freelancers. Uh, now many of them uh, work from home. They are both employees, uh, self-employed and freelancers. Think for example of the activities of architects, managers, scientists, engineers, designers, teachers, academics, writers, artists, analysts, administrators, accountants, and financial workers, marketing and public relations workers, software developers uh, and other digital workers yeah, that create digital goods and services. Think of lawyers, translators, secretaries, typists, call center agents, uh, consultants uh, and so on. There are two main problems that such workers face. First, they may face social and psychological overburdening when trying to work in the home that however at the same time uh, of such an existential crisis is a convergent space of manifold activities including care work, educational work, wage labor, survival work, uh, and so on. Second, given the relative shutdown of society, there is a reduced demand for services, which means that there might be uh, diminishing sources of income for many uh, home workers. It's decisive in this situation how governments support or do not support white collar workers and other workers uh, as part of uh, managing the coronavirus crisis. Neoliberal strategies uh, put capital and the economic interest first. But uh, as a consequence, white collar workers are expected to work at normal capacity and pace from their homes uh, and cannot rely on special support. 
In contrast, socialist strategies, they put survival, health, well-being and social security first uh, and over the profit uh, imperative. They support white-collar workers and other workers materially so that they do not face the existential danger uh, of material ruin. Uh, there are also workers in what could be termed critical uh, infrastructures. So critical infrastructures uh, are uh, necessary for society's survival uh, in an existential crisis. Uh, such work, uh, critical infrastructure work, is performed, for example, by doctors, nurses, care workers, midwives, paramedics, pharmacists, psychologists, firefighters, public transport workers, journalists, public service media workers, police officers, food producers, food processing workers, food delivery and transport workers, supermarket workers, post office and delivery workers, sanitation workers, pharmaceutical workers, manufacturing and assemblage workers uh, who produce medical equipment, uh, by utility workers, telecommunication workers, emergency workers, legal sector workers and so on. In general, workers in critical infrastructures face a higher risk of falling themselves ill yeah? uh, because in their work they have more direct social contacts than others. Think, for example, of doctors and nurses treating COVID-19 patients in hospitals. It's important uh, that governments and organizations do everything that is possible in order to pro provide uh, protective equipment, um, measures that uh, protective measures in general, and working conditions that protect these workers. A particular problem during the coronavirus crisis is the lack of protective equipment, uh, as a result of which many nurses and doctors uh, contracted uh, the virus. Uh, work uh, in critical infrastructures or workers in critical infrastructures tend to show a high level uh, of solidarity yeah, uh, in this crisis, uh, the uh, level of solidarity that is needed for securing the survival of society uh, and human uh, kind. There are people working in hospitals, uh, the care sector and so on. The crucial importance of their work should also be uh, acknowledged not just symbolically yeah, but also economically uh, and socially. Especially in emergency situations, we realize that the market provision of key infrastructures is bound to fail yeah? because the commodity form operates based on the profit principle and not on the principle of human interest. Insofar as key infrastructures are not public services, uh, establishing public ownership combined with worker control is a measure that puts humanism over the logic uh, of capital, uh, of capital, over the logic of capital accumulation, in countries such as the U.S. and the U.K., neoliberalism uh, has prevented or undermined the public provision of healthcare. As a consequence, uh, in uh, the, in this crisis, there is a lack of resources in the healthcare system, including personal uh, and physical resources, and there is also a lack of physical uh, of individuals' access to the healthcare system, yeah, uh, such as in the United States, yeah, uh, where there is private uh, insurance system where millions of people don't have access. So we can see that in such a state of exception, dysfunctional healthcare systems that have been privatized or partly privatized or underfunded uh, because of neoliberal cutbacks uh, uh, of, of the state and of state expenditure, uh, the, uh, the, all of these measures they multiply the number of deaths uh, in the crisis. It also, this also shows that universal health care and public ownership of the care sector are of crucial importance uh, for guaranteeing well-being for everyone. Uh, in this context, the writer and activist Mike Davis uh, argues uh, that the coronavirus pandemic shows that, I quote, capitalist globalization now appears to be biological unsustainable in the absence of a truly international public health infrastructure. And Bernie Sanders uh, commented in this context in the following way on the coronavirus crisis, I quote, millions of people are now demanding that we have a government that works for all. What role should the campaign play, the Bernie Sanders campaign, uh, in continuing that fight to make sure that healthcare becomes a human right and is not a privilege, that we raise the minimum wage to a living wage, etc., etc. People now understand that it is incomprehensible that we remain the only major country on earth not to guarantee healthcare to all, that we have an economy which leaves half of our people living paycheck to paycheck. What kind of system is it where people today are dying knowing they are sick, but they are not going to the hospital because they can't afford the bill that they'll be picking up? The coronavirus disease makes evident that the world uh, needs to realize a global right to public health care, public health care at a high, high standard for all. Uh, 
uh, the Marxist humanist theorist and uh, economist and geographer David Harvey argues in this context, I quote, The spiral form of endless capital accumulation is collapsing inward from one part of the world to every other. The only thing that can save, uh, save it is a government-funded and inspired mass consumerism conjured out of nothing. This will require socializing the whole of the economy without calling it socialism. What about old, weak and ill uh, individuals as a social group uh, in the coronavirus crisis? Old people and people suffering from cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, cancer and other uh, horrible diseases or those who have a weakened immune system are either particular risk to die from co uh, the coronavirus disease. Many governments therefore have recommended or, or mandated that at-risk groups should stay at home and isolate themselves for weeks and for months. This, however, entails the problem that reduced direct social context might be experienced as a psychological burden. The use of communication technologies for staying in touch with your loved ones and communities is not a fix for the uh, lack of direct social context, although it's a means for providing certain forms of emotional support. Older people also face a digital divide. Uh, this group's physical, motivational and skills access to digital technologies is significantly lower than uh, the one uh, the ones of the younger generation. And given this digital divide, older people face a particular risk of feeling lonely and depressed uh, as a result of social distancing. Whereas neoliberal strategies, uh, strategies and strategists simply tell pensioners in such situations and weak people to isolate without supporting measures, uh, a socialist strategy uh, takes di a different uh, perspective. It devises measures in order to alleviate the psychological burdens uh, caused by social isolation. Example measures include social and community services that provide food, install easy-to-use communication technologies in the homes of at-risk groups, uh, the, uh, groups that engage, uh, community groups that engage in daily contacts with at-risk individuals, uh, and so on. What about children and youth learning and e-learning in the coronavirus crisis? So in the coronavirus crisis, many countries shut, have shut nurseries, primary and secondary schools and universities. As a consequence, children and youth uh, need to stay at home with their parents. The general expectation from uh, educational institutions and governments has been that teaching continues as a distance, making use of email, video conferencing, messaging systems uh, and a variety of different e-learning technologies. The first problem that, however, arises is that children, and especially small children, need lots of attention, which con can conflict with parents uh, who, uh, who are forced to work uh, from the home and to continue to work uh, at, uh, at uh, full uh, capacity and speed. Uh, in such situations, parents have to act not just as workers and carers, but also as teachers. Yeah? Uh, a socialist strategy has to put childcare and well-being over labor. Yeah? In an such an existential crisis of society, wages should be continue to be paid and subsidized by governments without any performance expectations. Yeah? States of emergency are radical ruptures of society. One cannot expect that life can simply continue as normal. Yeah? It is not a normal situation. Therefore, also the educational performance expectations of young people, of pupils and students should be suspended. Yeah? Uh, I think a feasible option is that uh, learning materials and social support uh, over distance should certainly be provided uh, from schools, universities and so on, but there should be no exams and all students and pupils should automatically pass. The second problem uh, is that uh, e-learning uh, is uh, purely mediated and purely virtual in, the, uh, in in this situation of the coronavirus crisis and therefore tends to be inefficient and difficult to organize. Nice. In e-learning, uh, the standard is blended learning, where virtual learning at a distance is combined with face-to-face -face learning sessions. Um, this has become a generally accepted standard uh, in e-learning. Yeah? Uh, in the coronavirus crisis, e-learning is radically virtual, yeah? uh, which can easily reach certain limits and can cause problems. Uh, at the same time, when uh, the performance principles of grading, success and failure are kept up under such uh, difficult learning con conditions, uh, learning can become counterproductive to uh, cultural and uh, the cultural and social development uh, of uh, young people. Uh, I think it's time now uh, for a musical uh, break. Yeah, and we will listen to a song, a song by uh, Lou Barlow. Yeah, Lou Barlow, uh, the frontman uh, of Centrido, uh, of Sebado, uh, and the Folk Implosion, uh, who also was uh, a member of Dinosaur Junior. Uh, we will listen to the song 
Home by Lou Barlow. Uh, this was performed on WFMU uh, radio uh, in 2010 uh, and uh, the song is available uh, as, a, uh, as Creative Commons uh, on the Free Music Archive, Free Music Archive, one word, dot uh, org. Uh, so let's listen to Lou Barlow and Home. Ready? Look at you Hide behind your sweater What I want to say Let it fall away I don't care If we're Just it on my own I can never bring you home Second guess to drift in all directions Let's go. Barlow and Home, uh, great performer, uh, great uh, song. Next, I want to talk about global cities and rural areas in the coronavirus crisis. So, in general, we can say that global capitalism created a power gap, a, a spatial power gap between global cities on the one hand and rural areas uh, on the other side. What are global cities? Global cities are urban agglomerations of capital, labor power, companies, banks, infrastructures, corporate headquarters, service industries, uh, international finance capital, telecommunication facilities and so on. So global cities include, for example, among others, New York, London, Tokyo, Paris, Frankfurt, Zurich, Amsterdam, Los Angeles, Sydney, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Hong Kong uh, and so on. Sociologist Saskia Sassen writes about global cities. 
The more globally the economy becomes, the higher the agglomeration of central functions in, a relatively, in relatively few sites, that is, the global cities. And David Harvey uh, argues, uh, writes, uh, the need to minimize circulation costs as well as turnover times of capital promotes agglomeration of production within few large urban centers, which become, in effect, the workshops of, cap of capitalist production. End of quote. So, Geographical expansion goes hand in hand with uh, geographical concentration and creates uh, a power differential between uh, global cities on the one hand uh, and rural areas uh, that uh, tend to be, uh, be uh, poor, where there's a lack uh, of uh, infrastructures, public services, uh, where young people from which uh, young people move away to the global uh, cities, yeah, so that uh, there's high unemployment uh, in these uh, uh, rural uh, 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 areas, uh, the uh, age uh, uh, the, uh, the average age uh, is increasing uh, and so on. Whereas wealth and power are concentrated in global cities, there's a lack of resources, people uh, and infrastructures in many rural areas. But in the coronavirus crisis, people living den in densely populated global cities are at a disadvantage in comparison to those in rural areas. There's a lack of natural spaces and accessible gardens in global cities. It's very hard for families and individuals living in such cities to uh, endure social isolation. It is especially difficult for those who have kids eh, uh, but live in small apartments without uh, access uh, to a garden. Uh, in, that's in the coronavirus crisis. Yeah, uh, this situation is, is difficult for such groups, and it's more difficult in uh, uh, in large uh, cities than uh, in smaller rural areas. The high population density in global cities makes it more likely and easier that the virus spreads there yeah, than uh, in sparsely populated rural areas. People in rural areas are less likely to contract uh, the virus and they have better uh, access to nature, which makes it easier to cope uh, with isolation measures, with social distancing. David Harvey writes about uh, the coronavirus crisis. I quote, High density human populations would seem an easy host target. It is well known that measles as epidemic for example, only flourish in larger urban population centers, but rapidly die out in sparsely populated regions. How human beings interact with each other, move around, discipline themselves or forget to wash their hands affects how diseases get transmitted. End of quote. So, in the coronavirus crisis, the unequal geography of capitalism has partly been reversed in respect to the absolute and relative number of illnesses and death. death uh, so rural areas certainly face the disadvantage of less equipped and uh, or often, not necessarily, but often face the disadvantage uh, of less equipped and less advanced hospitals, but their inhabitants are overall less likely to contract the virus uh, than the inhabitants uh, of global cities. So this brings this uh, podcast episode uh, to uh, an end. Uh, it, this uh, episode focused on the analysis of a variety of aspects of everyday life and everyday communication in the coronavirus crisis. I outlined profound changes of how space-time uh, is organized uh, in societies uh, struck by the new pandemic. Uh, it became evident that the well-being of everyday people depends on political economy and what policies uh, governments take in response to uh, the crisis. Uh, this means that political responses to the crisis range on a continuum between neoliberalism on the one side uh, and socialism uh, on uh, the other side. Uh, there will be a second part uh, of this uh, talk uh, in the next uh, episode of the Communication, Capitalism and Critique uh, podcast. So this, this, my discussion of everyday life and everyday communication uh, in the coronavirus crisis will uh, continue. There will be uh, a second part. Uh, so please follow this uh, podcast wherever to you are listening uh, to it. Subscribe to it uh, to get updates. Uh, the second part will the, uh, in, the, in the next uh, pod uh, will focus on how and what type of ideology is communicated in the context of uh, the coronavirus crisis. So it will focus on ideology and fake news uh, about the coronavirus crisis, that, uh, on how it is, uh, fake news is communicated online, uh, and so on. Thanks for listening, uh, and I hope you will tune in uh, again uh, next time.